And can we actually use CO2? Is there any sort of use for CO2 other than just putting it on the ground? And then how can we securely make sure it stays in the ground? So that's really what our research project at Imperial is about. It's about looking at how can we actually make sure it stays on the ground and understanding all the fundamental science that goes around that. And I'll show you a couple of videos of our latest research done by some of our people. It's really interesting, really groovy. And you'll see you know, what we're doing, cutting edge research. And effectively, what I'm here to do today, particularly, is help you understand how we're improving the certainty that we're going to keep the CO2 on the ground. It's not, I'm not reducing the uncertainty, because that's quite low already. So I'm just helping to improve the certainty. So you see a, a diagram by Jeff, but let's just go through this again for CCS. What you're seeing here is basically all we're really interested in in CCS is large point sources. So you've got power stations, refineries, uh, biomass um, power stations, coal, others, petrochemicals. But even in the future, if we go completely renewable for energy, we're always, always going to need petrochemicals, aluminium, steel, cement batteries, producing large amounts of CO2. So CCS will have a function to play in the future. From there, basically, the transport is either pipeline or by ship here. Even international shipping, the, the IMO, have recently decided not to curb CO2 emissions from ships. And they make up a small percentage of the global emissions, but still quite significant emission. Uh, ships are also very beneficial because they burn the heavy fuel oil, the really dirty stuff that no one really can use. But anyway, they, they transport it either offshore or onshore, and you store it deep underground. So it's Nottingham produced this nice little summary of that. So you've already seen the global view of CCS, uh, climate, sorry, CO2 emissions around the world. That I showed with Jeff and then the Industrial Revolutions. But what's the worst thing that can happen? Well, it depends on where you are in the world. It's all very localized climate change. You've heard about extreme weather events. Well, that's, you know, how that's going to pan out in the UK is sort of an unknown. However, sea level rise is fairly predictable. And we've got a fairly good handle on what sea level is going to do in the UK. And also, laddering on to that, the cert real, some of the real uncertainties about climate change is what's going to happen at the sea sea ice boundary, and what's going to happen when all the ice melts. Particularly in, as I've mentioned here, in Greenland and in the, the Arctic, which is going to affect us because that affects the Labrador current, and the Labrador current then has a knock-on effect in the Gulf Stream and keeping us unusually warm where we are sitting in this island. So there we are, basically. There's the UK, right up north, way, way northern far north than most of the frozen landscape in Canada. Okay, we should be cold, but we're not because of the Gulf Stream. And that comes up and warms up, keeps open the, the channels through to the Russian uh, side over Finland and Norway. But the more and more this melts, the more and more the Labrador current, this, this black issue here, pushes down and affects the Gulf Stream. So it's not only is there the actual CO2 in the air, but this can have a knock-on effect on the ocean circulation, which has a lot longer uh, sort of say time scale of movement than, than in the um, atmosphere. And it'll be interesting to find out what happens this year. This year, I don't know if you've all been watching the news recently in this particular aspect, but it's going to be an El Nino year. El Nino is an ocean phenomena of South, Amer uh, South America, and that has a major knock on effect throughout the world's uh, actual atmospheric and ocean systems. So lots of things start happening coral bleaching, etc. Now, this is probably the only time in your life you'll ever see a slide from the IPCC and a figure from the Daily Mail on the same slide. So I'm quite proud of this one. But basically, sea level rise is predicted to go up. Sorry, sea level rise is predicted to happen and, and the sea levels will go up. Uh, the projections in the future are uncertain, so sea level is much more harder to predict, etc., than, than the climate actual models are. So much more weaker models. But we still manage to predict that. And basically, you're looking at somewhere between uh, 20 to 50 centimeters in the next, within the next century. Depending on where you are in the world, that can have big problems. Bangladesh, going to be a lot of trouble. Some uh, low-lying countries and islands in the Pacific, major, major issues here. They were already being swamped by high tides and storm events. And some of these people are going to move out permanently and leave their, their country. And now they're going to be basically um, 
country list. In the UK, this is from the Daily Mail actually, so it's quite impressive, uh, where it will be inundated with a one meter sea level rise. So we're looking much longer term uh, within the next 150, 200 years. And of course, they're saying it's okay because we've got the Thames barrier. Well, that would be a good test if the Thames barrier, if that's still working then to the way it's expected to be. But there you go, Southeast England will be quite a lot of it will be gone. So that's the future. And so I'm going to move on to how we actually capture carbon dioxide. And this, sort of the, this is meant to be a, a techie sort of event, pint of science event. And we have several ways. Um, one I haven't actually mentioned here because it is, it, it's very similar to pre-combustion, is the gas processing. So uh, this is what Jeff referred to, we already do this. So for gas processing, when we get the gas out of the ground, we have to clean the gas before we can burn it in our power stations. And we have to remove the CO2 and other contaminants, nitrogen, helium, uh, H2S, other contaminants, out of the gas. So quite regularly, we already capture the CO2, and then we just vent it. Because nobody is making the companies put it in the ground. And it's not economical to sell it to anyone. So there is millions of tons around the world already being captured and then just vented because there is no economics for it. That's very similar to so post-combustion capture. Sorry, I should have said. So yeah, there's three. There's pre-combustion before you burn it. There's oxy-fuel combustion, which is a fancy type of uh, burning it with lots of oxygen instead of air. And then there's post-combustion, which is you're all familiar with your catalytic converter in your car and things that basically you just put it on the end of the pipe and you, once you've burnt it, then you deal with the problem. An end of pipe solution. Uh, we've already done that with socks and NOx around the world. So you know, socks is a big problem in the 80s. NOx is an ongoing problem, but being addressed now. Uh, NOx is a, uh, something that can cause ground level ozone. So it's very, very, ozone you think is good. Ozone on the ground is very bad. And so these are being addressed already to improve our quality of health because they directly impact us immediately. CO2 doesn't really impact us at 400 parts per million or 600 parts per million. It doesn't affect you as a human being, but it will affect the climate. Unfortunately, as Jeff has said, this all costs real money and reduced efficiency in the power stations. So in pre-combustions, effectively, this is a very easy sketch of what goes on. This is not a chemical engineering sketch. It's not an engineer sketch. Engineers would, would, would go crazy here. But effectively, you've got your air and your, your oxygen. You put it through the separation and you get the carbon dioxide. You, you get the hydrogen, which is the fuel you use. The hydrogen is the actual fuel that you burn. And that produces your, your, power, your, your power. The oxy-fuel combustion. Now, Jeff mentioned there's two CCS projects in the UK. One called the White Rose. I don't know if you know the, the different projects. One's in Peterhead, or Peterhead, as we should be saying, in Scotland, and one's in uh, White Rose in, in near us. And the oxyfuel one is one in uh, White Rose. So this takes basically pure oxygen and burns the fuel in the presence of pure oxygen instead of air. Therefore, it's a lot cleaner exhaust fumes, and you can get the CO2 a lot easier. And then the post combustion. So this is the end of pipe solution. You just work as normal, and, and then you basically strip the CO2 off at the end, like you do with the NOx and SOx and particulate matter. So it's just another end of pipe solution, basically. And these are all courtesy of a, a group in, in Australia who, who do nice, simple diagrams that I can understand. So if I can understand it, that's good. So moving on to this post-combustion. Why am I concentrating on this rather than the others? This is because this is the one around the world when we look at CCS projects, Generally, they use post-combustion. Particularly the, the top one here, the amines, the solvent as, uh, absorption. Okay? So basically, they have an amine solution. The gas goes through it. It traps the CO2 in there. It then gets moved to a different uh, vessel, as they call it in the industry. You heat that up. It releases the CO2. And then you recirculate that amine solution back in to capture more CO2. So in all the big plants around the world, effectively, this is what's used. Uh, you might have heard, heard of some of them, um, Sleipner, Snovit, and there's also new ones in Canada, Quest, and, and Weyburn, etc. generally use this technology. This is ready, deployable, because industry know it and like it and understand how to use it. 
we're now getting towards the, case, the, the situation of testing new uh, developing technologies. So OxyFuel is in White Rose, but that's been previously tested by Total in France at LAC and other places. So the other types of technology we have, membranes, surface adsorption. So rather than dissolving it, that's actually just the CO2 adhering to the surface of a material. And we have lots of these possibilities. Uh, all basically, unfortunately, in basically a lab scale right now. And then we also have the cryogenic, so basically just, just freezing the CO2 out. And then we have chemical looping and, and other technologies that we have, we have available. So as I mentioned, the amine-based one is pretty simple. The flue gas goes to the liquid, we exchange the liquid in a different vessel, and we apply heat, and it releases CO2. Right? This is the basics of what happened. Now, there are various things. This liquid is quite costly, so you want to conserve it. You want to use it as, as, as wisely as possible. You're also going to get a little bit of this liquid coming out with the CO2 in a vapor form. And so those are some of the major uh, issues to do with the current technology is that we want to actually understand what are the health effects of deploying this on a mass scale. Because it will need to be far bigger than what we currently do. A membrane technology. So we already know membrane technology quite well from things like reverse osmosis and desalination. And now we're basically using them again in, in industry to look at CO2 separation. This is the absorption one where we have here zeolite basically, and it it's basically just captures the CO2 and you apply pressure, and then the CO2 will come off. But a lot of these are very much, uh, as we call them, sort of bench scale lab tests. They haven't been fully commercialized yet. Cryogenic, I mentioned chemical looping. So we move on to transport. That's my capture. That's how I see the capture world. It's fairly simple because I don't work, work in that world. But ask questions, and I'm sure I'll be able to get someone to answer them for you. Uh, transportation. Um, so tra transporting CO2 is fairly simple in my view. We already transport lots of gases around the country, in the, in the UK, but we don't transport CO2. There's no real CO2 distribution network in the UK. So that's going to have to be built. Uh, however, in the U US, we already have well over 3,000 kilometers of, of CO2 pipelines. So we know that it can be done. It's relatively simple. We have pipelines in the UK that are basically of the right materials to handle CO2 because they've ha handled something called acid gas when, or, or, or slightly sour gas. Uh, when the, when the coming from the gas fields, it's slightly acidic. It will corrode normal pipelines. Therefore, you have to use a special type of, of pipeline. And again, moving them, well, we can move it by tankers. Behind the bar, not, maybe not in this bar, but further down in the next bar below us, there'll be cylinders of CO2. And they just get moved around all over the place. We're all quite happy with massive amounts of CO2 behind the bar in your bottles of Perrier water. That's the CO2 in the water. Okay. Now, we also have lots of ex experience with moving liquid in another form, whether it's petroleum or liquefied natural gas around. And we do that in big ships, and we can do that in small ships. This is a big LPG tanker, but we also have large LNG tankers and very small LNG tankers. And in Japan, they can't really build pipelines very easily. So what they do instead is they have lots of small little LNG tankers, and they move them from power station to power station delivering the, the gas cargoes. And it's using that sort of technology and adapting that to CO2, where we can start to move the CO2 around and actually get it uh, deployed where we need to, from the sink to the store. So to me, the transportation is not a big issue. If you have a rupture in the pipeline, it's not going to explode because it's CO2. There are issues to do with it settling and impressions in the ground, but we have various ways to look at that and, and, and deal with that. OK, so utilization. I mentioned that. Uh, several of these options to someone during the break, and she left, so she wasn't very impressed. Basically, I didn't want to go into CO2 EOR, because that's a whole different debate, particularly now in the UK, when it's starting to warm up. But CO2 EOR is one of the key utilizations or utilization methods of, of, of carbon dioxide. Uh, CO2, for those of you who don't know, why, why would the oil and gas industry want to use CO2? 
It helps to, it's a solvent, and it helps to mobilize the CO2, uh, the oil that's stuck down there, or even the gas. It will displace the oil and gas from the pores within the rocks. Now, I'll come on to you, you'll just see some of that in a second. Uh, but as far as greenhouses go, uh, industrial uses, uses for inhalers or wherever else you might think of, there's not that much of those uses compared to the amount of CO2 we produce and is also typically a source in the sink issue. Um, so my summary of its utilization is it's fairly insignificant in the big picture. Locally, it could be important. And CO2 EOR is a different kettle of fish altogether, I'd say. UK could be very important in the future. Certain parts of the world will be very important, CO2 EOR. So the, the pipelines here in America, I should say, these are all basically CO2 EOR pipelines. Uh, most of them, bizarrely enough, in America, they take the CO2 from a natural source, they have to pay for that, and then they use the CO2 for enhanced oil recovery. So they're not using CO2 from a power station, it's actually from a CO2 reservoir. So deep down on the ground, there's CO2 trapped in the rocks. They drill down to get the CO2, transport it out of the pipeline to the, the actual field where they want to extract the, the, the oil from. There are now building more and more power stations in the US with CCS in mind, and that's all rolling on quite nicely in the US. The US is very active in the CCS scheme of things. Some of you may not think that the, the US is very pro-climate change, etc. It is actually quite big on the CCS topic and doing a lot of good research. So we're going to move on to the work that I more a lot more about, and that's the storage. That's where I really want to sort of convince you that we really know what we're doing, and this is basically when we put the CO2 on the ground, we're confident it's not going to come back. So there are basically four ways that we trap the CO2 underground. Now, typically, we would store them in a saline aquifer to begin with, which is a saline aquifer is a salty water, uh, far, typically far saltier than seawater. So you can't drink it. You can't even really use it as desalination. You can't use it in crops or anything like that. So it's just a big reservoir of salty water, and we want to inject the CO2 into, into that sort of target. It's really what we want. Um, that's, I believe, what Wright Rose will be doing. Peter Head, on the other hand, is injecting it into a depleted gas reservoir. It's not going to extract oil and gas. It's not an EOR project. It's just <coughs> saying we've got this reservoir. We know it really well because we've characterized it and we've produced from it for a number of years, and we're going to store the CO2 in this reservoir. And so that's where, where the situation is. We're going to try and inject within these deep reservoirs. Uh, and why it's deep, I'll come on to in a second. So we have four, basically, trapping mechanisms. The first is the structural, and that is basically a, what we call a cap rock or a seal. So the injection, where we inject is one reservoir, and above that is another reservoir that's basically made of material that's very, very non-permeable. By that, I mean things can't flow through it. So the CO2 will bounce against it and stop there, and it will migrate to wherever it is the, the, the sort of the top of the house. And it will just migrate up into that attic space and stay there effectively. That's the idea. So that's the first trapping mechanism. So we're looking for storage sites with that structural trapping capacity. We're then also going to try and look at, what have I got down here, dissolution? Yeah. So dissolution trapping. That's when the CO2 gets into the actual liquids that surround that reservoir. As I said here, it's sparkling water. Effectively, you're just getting it to dissolve into the the brine solution that's around. That's a longer term approach. There's capillary trapping, and I'll show you some of that in a small video. Now it's effectively in these tiny pore spaces in the rock, we can trap the bubbles of CO2 because the, the rock prefers to have water touching it, or brine, rather than the CO2. So as the brine will flow, th flow through the pore, it will go around the CO2 against the rock, and so you have this bubble of CO2 trapped there. And we've shown through our experiments, no matter how hard you press, basically that bubble will not move. It will be trapped there. So I'll show you that in a second. The last one, which we don't really work on, is mineralization. And that's because mineralization is a long, long-term process. And we've only got funding for 10 years, so we're not going to be able to do it. But no, on all, on all seriousness, it's a, it's a very long-term process. There are ways we can speed it up, 
that's not within what we are interested in looking at within our programme. It is very long um, term and it's very secure. It turns the CO2 into effectively rock, mineralizes it, as it says as its name, and therefore exceptionally secure storage. There are people looking at speeding this up in the lab bench and trying to do this quicker and, and make stuff out of it, and hopefully they'll be successful, but at the moment it's purely lab-based. And I've got down here some myth-busting things that are effectively we're not going to put carbon dioxide into massive caves on the ground. Okay? The type of rock we're going to put it into, I have an example of here. Spot who I support. <laughs> this is Portland rock. Right, this is quite a common rock, building rock as well. So the Royal School of Mines, if you ever go to Imperial College down Prince Consort Road, you'll see the Royal School of Music, Royal School of Mines. That building is made out of this rock. And this is a very good rock for our experiments. Not the best, it's not, not that porous, but uh, it, it's a good rock. And it's a carbonate rock. Unfortunately, most of the rocks we'll be storing stuff in here in the UK are sandstones. But if you listen to the name of my research centre, it's Qatar Carbonates. In the Middle East, everything's far more carbonate orientated. But luckily, a lot of our research is relevant to the UK because carbonates are far more complicated than sandstones. I won't get into why, unless you ask me later. So we have to use sandstones first. So a lot of our work, we already do a lot of the research is relevant to the UK before going on to tackle the, the situation in Qatar. So I need to jump out now and quickly show a video that will take you to the subsurface and what's happening with storage and the various different trapping mechanisms. If you can do that for me. The, no, the trapping will be used. The Qatar carbonates. Do you want the sound? No, just take it out. Another disclaimer if you booked a ticket a week ago, my name wouldn't have been on this, it would have been someone else. So I've just stepped in at the last minute. So. <laughs> Okay, so basically this is something we produced for the COP18, in, in which was a big United Nations meeting in, in Qatar, in Doha, to discuss the climate change. And what we have here, effectively, if I can step in and pause this occasionally. Ah, go on, go away. Okay, so I want to stop this because I wanted to show you, this is a sort of a schematic of a reservoir. They're far more complicated than this. But effectively, you have the, the surface ground, and then you have portable water, what we drink, which is uh, typically a, a couple of hundred meters deep, maybe deeper. And then you have various different type of reservoir rocks. Okay, so here we have basically our little diagram of our little well, and we're, we're going to be injecting CO2 in here, effectively. Um, if I remember correctly, we might inject CO2 in a couple other layers as well. But this dark area is the cap rock, okay? the deep, deep saline aquifer. So you've actually got lots of really salty water in there and it's actually moving at a very slow rate but it's still moving around. It's a hydrodynamic. And here, what we've demonstrated here is we would inject CO2 here. These lines are what we call faults. Okay? If we injected CO2 here, there's a likelihood that they would migrate up this fault and then potentially go through the cap rock. So when you see that in the subsurface, you think, ah, not a very good place to store CO2. So this is why we're chosen to, to inject in this one here. Of course, only the big faults are sort of recognizable in <coughs> seismic surveys, which is what the oil and gas industry do and are masters of. When it gets smaller, then it's a different story. They're quite hard to see. And a lot of our work is going over to the Middle East, looking at big, big mountains and going in really close and trying to understand the fractures on the outcrops that are actually in the subsurface in Qatar. Quite boring, but there we go. Oh, that's the geology part of the, of the course. Um, yeah, so we'll start playing again. So we inject CO2 in something called the dense phase. So it's like super critical. So it's a gas, but it behaves like a liquid. So it's quite important. And this is deep down in the reservoir. That's the sort of pore space. These are grains of CO2, these are grains of rock and brine. And sometimes 
depending on where you are, there might be some residual hydrocarbons, like in the, the Peterhead example, the golden eye field. Okay, so what we have is basically we're injecting the CO2, that's the yellow, and the CO2 is flowing through the pore spaces around the grains, these are the big grains, and on a bigger scale, effectively, what, what's created is called a buoyant plume. So here the, the, the CO2 flows up and comes in contact with the cap rock and then moves out. And so what then happens is effectively, over time, the hydrodynamic forces and the water moves through, or we can inject water through. I got it slightly wrong timing-wise. Okay, so reactive flow. So before that process, uh, the CO2 can react with the grains. This is in carbonates. Uh, it can happen in some standstones, but generally in the UK, it's not particularly going to happen too much. This is far more for the situation in the Middle East, so it's far more complicated, as I said, uh, for, for storage in, in that aspect. And that's where the CO2 actually reacts with the carbonate grains, can eat away at them, but also deposit elsewhere and precipitate out solids elsewhere and cause some issues there. And so this is when we're injecting the CO, the, 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 we can inject water, or this naturally the water will flow through the reservoir, and then it will trap these bubbles of CO2 within the pore spaces. Now, you may think this is all a bit make-believe, but I can show you a video where we actually do this. And we do actually trap these bubbles completely, and they stay there, and therefore this is what we call the residual CO2. So it sort of leaves a slug trail as the CO2 plume moves through the reservoir. And we can quantify that, and therefore we can add to what we call the site um, storage characteristics. We can say this site here is going to store this much CO2. In the long term, the plume will move further out and eventually it will mix with the surrounding brown water and you'll get these fingers coming down because of the gravity uh, density driven flow. CO2 with brine is a lot heavier than just the brine, but it takes time to happen. And then finally, this is the final process that we mentioned, uh, mineralization is going to be happening. So we can stop there. I've skipped over a lot. I should know that better. I wrote the, the script for it, but there we go. I've forgotten some of it. So we'll move out. So I'll go into some of the research we're doing at Imperial College. So we like to think that we're really sort of leading the, the, the field in what we call digital rocks. Digital rocks is something where we take the rock cores that you see, we've got a big one going round. We put that maybe up to a meter long inside a medical CT scanner. So the human body can fit inside these scanners, obviously and uh, we scan them and we see what's going on inside. We also have a pretty neat uh, piece of equipment that can take far better resolution pictures of far smaller cores. So this is one of our micro CT cores. And this is what we put into our micro CT and the video you see is of basically CO2 flowing through this core. So again, I'll pass it around. It is pretty small, but the resolution we get is fairly fantastic. Nathan, you don't know anything about this. <laughs> Nathan's one of the PhD students working with micro CT analysis. Yeah. So I promise not long to go, believe me. No, no, so, sorry. Okay, yeah, let's play the video. Okay. So th this is our video, basically. And what we're doing, so this is a CT scan. So it slices. Your CT scan has lots of slices of the body. And you put them together and you get a 3D image. So we're doing exactly the same with this very small rock core. What you see here, I've got to explain what things are and then the computer will sort of do the work. You have a grain, this is a grain of, of carbonate. And you'll see black blobs and you'll see grayer blobs. So all these sort of whitishy gray blobs, trust me, are grains, okay? The gray sort of coloration, that's brine. And the black blob is supercritical CO2. Now a couple of years ago, we were the first sort of college to, or university to image supercritical CO2 within a rock. So this is really new research. And this is actually far more advanced than what we did because we only got a couple of slices in that first trial. We then managed to buy a new machine on, on the basis of that and got some really amazing images. And we also go to, I don't know if you know, there's a synchrotron, I don't even know what a synchrotron is, a, the diamond light source, a very, very powerful X-ray up in, um, near Oxford. And we go there and we scan rocks. It's normally reserved for medical research and very high-end material research. And then we Trump turn up with our rocks and our liquids and we cause havoc. They don't like us. We spill things and everything, it's dreadful. 
So basically what happens then, the computer goes through and does some fancy algorithms and takes away stuff and figures out, actually, that's rock, that's CO2, that's brine. It can color it all fancy, so then it can then put it through an image analysis machine that can pull this out as it's moving through the core. And what we have left, we've stripped everything away bar the CO2. So these are what we call our clusters of CO2. And we've just colored them to make it look nice. But yeah, so these are clusters, clumps of supercritical CO2 that are trapped. So our PhD student has tried as much as he could to try and move the CO2 out of these pore spaces and has failed. Because when you saw the original image, you saw these are sort of bubbles. And it doesn't like being in contact with the rock surface. <coughs> so the water will flow around it. And this is one of our main mechanisms for trapping CO2 safely underground, basically forever. It will eventually dis dissolve slightly into the surrounding the, the water, and then potentially mineralization will occur. OK, well now with our very fancy machine, what we can do is go, actually, I want to have a little zoom in here and see what's going on with this one little blob. So we highlight a little blob and reprocess the data. And we're talking, we, we, we work in terabytes of data. We're big data handlers now. And we basically reprocess that scan and go, actually, let's make it a really, really nicer looking image. And we can get that blob looking far rounder. And that's what he did. He spent weeks and weeks doing this, poor chap. And he comes out with a lovely little blob of CO2. So this is, again, supercritical CO2 with rock and brine surrounding it and slightly different shades. You can't really make it out very clearly. But what we did there was then define the contact angle where the brine, the CO2, and the rock is, is all touching each other. And there's lots of fantastic things that reservoir engineers can do and learn from those, this sort of data. I won't go into too much detail. But yeah, this is real cutting edge leading science that we're now doing. So I'll get back to the presentation, which is where. Thank you. So just moving on, just to let you see what these sort of things also look like. This is a medical CT scan. So yeah, this is a scanner here, typical medical CT scanner. It's a bit fancy. It's got this big yellow cage around it because we can turn it the other way and do fancy things with it, but forget about that. What you have here is scans of carbonate and a sandstone. The sandstone, as it says, it's a very, very easy, homogeneous, easy to understand. Lots of just basically sand layers. Carbonate's got lots of shells and gastropods and lots of things in it that cause havoc with flow. And that's what we are studying. And here, basically, <coughs> when, we, when, we, when we do a CT scan, the CT number, as it's called, the, the way the, the amount of it can absorb the CT x-rays, uh, tells you the, the, the density of the subject. And from that, we can understand if it's rock, if it's brine, or how much brine and CO2 there is. So that's a different coloration. Lots of CO2 in the red and lots of brine, uh, just brine in the blue. And we've taken the rock away completely. So we understand how CO2 can flow through our rocks on quite a large scale. And then, as I said, we also have this micro CT scanner that we can then understand things on a much finer scale. The biggest problem is how do we then build all this up knowledge up into making it into a reservoir scale, which can be tens to hundreds of kilometers in dimension. And that's a big challenge, and we're working on that one. But yeah, this one again just shows you the machine, the various scans of different rocks we have. And then basically we can also not only tell um, the pore space, and, and et cetera, we can also tell the type of actual minerals that make up the rocks which is quite important in knowing the sort of how things are going to react. Again, more relevant for the Middle East scenario than the, than the UK scenario. And again, just an example here of basically what we do with our micro CT scans. We, we make this, this is the first image published, and then we actually be able to form clusters and quantify how much the CO2 is trapped. Uh, and again, it's a nice little image of an actual little cluster of CO2. Um, so that's sort of summarizing some of our key aspects in our research. There are, there's, there's lots to go into. I haven't even touched on how we look at phase behavior, which is how CO2 interacts with hydrocarbons and brine at different temperatures and pressures. There's lots of research going on to, into that aspect in our, in our research center as well. And all this basically feeds into something that we call predictive modeling. So basically, we want to be able to predict what's going to happen. At the moment, we have models that will tell us, which is great, 
But a lot of the time we have to fix those models to data or f go, well, that model doesn't really say what happens in reality. Let's change it around. Let's muck around with it. Whereas we want to try and produce far more predictive models so that our, we really have increasing our certainty in what we're doing with the CO2 subsurface. And I think with that, uh, so I've just got some basically the sort of what's going to happen in short term R&D and long term, etc. So what do I have here? OK, so as Jeff mentioned, we have the technologies. So let's go. Let's go and do it. We need to deploy more pilot and demonstration projects as soon as possible. In the UK, we have two projects that are not actually past what's called FID, the final investment decision. So they may not actually happen, although the government is being supportive. No, the climate needs to be good for it. And there's also Grange Maths, so it's almost a third that's coming up. Uh, Norway already has two, it's operational. Nowhere else in Europe has any, as far as I know. So we're not that far behind Norway, but Norway are quite far ahead. Norway do it differently. If you emit CO2, you pay $40 or now $50 per tonne. Therefore, it's a case of, well, let's store the CO2, it costs less. So they do that. Okay, and one of the things I've mentioned is upscaling. That, that's a really big issue that we have, and, and we're, everyone's looking into that, but basically it is, it's developing. And so, yeah, I think I'll finish there, because I've got some other medium-term and long-term objectives, but I think that's possibly too techy. And basically, the long-term objective is we want more demonstration projects in the UK. That's the key message, is demonstration projects, because from demonstration projects, we learn about what's actually happening rather than just at the lab where we think we know what's going to happen. But actually, when we get out there, we, we learn a lot more by doing demonstration projects and injecting CO2 on the ground. None of these actually cause any problems or leakages. It's just a case of, just, oh, that's interesting. Why has this happened? Or why, why did this happen? And we can go back to our models and try and understand it and then get more research money to do more work. So um, I think I'll end it there. And thank you very much for listening. If you have any questions, Jeff, myself, and others will be willing to answer. So thank you. 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 Right, so yeah, good question. So, um, how much do you know about seismic surveys? Not much. Okay, so, what the oil and gas industry do when it looks for oil is effectively it does these things called seismic surveys. And it goes out and basically it gets this image back that says lots of lines, blue and red lines, a different density and how it reflects, okay? And from that, they've got different wells and they know what the geological formations were in those two wells. And basically, they pay some geologists lots of money to draw those lines together and link that up. And from those seismic surveys, you can see large faults, big faults. As I said, you can't really see the smaller faults. But you trust in either your, 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 your data picking that up or, like, for example, the Norwegian case in, in Snovit, which was the LNG uh, CCS project, they started injecting. And basically, they had a problem after about 9, 12 months that they kept on uh, having a bit of a, a peak in the pressure. So they monitored the pressure, and the pressure went up. And they said, well, we don't want to go too high, because then you, you go, get, get what you call the fracture pressure of the reservoir. And they don't want to go that high. So they stopped. And they go, well, what, what's causing this? And their initial thought was, well, probably salt dry out. Because one of the issues when you pump supercritical CO2 down, or dense phase CO2, is it can dry out all the, the water around you and that precipitates the salt and it blocks all the pores and therefore it's hard to, to move the CO2 around. And so they thought, okay, we'll pump something down to remove that. And so they pumped a chemical called MEG down, which is industry standard. And about three months later, the same thing happened. And they thought, oh, stop. Okay, pump more MEG down. And about four or five months later, the same thing happened. So they said, okay, this is, this is a problem. This shouldn't be happening. This reservoir should be, be able to tolerate this much, we've only just started. And so they went back to the seismic, reanalyzed it, started really process things very, very carefully, and they realized they missed a small fault. And that small fault basically compartmentalized where they were injecting. So it was getting a pressure increase. And so they said, well, you know, basically tough, we can't inject there anymore. 
So they had to re-inject somewhere else. They had to come out and re-drill somewhere else. So we've got ways to understand that. If it does happen and we don't observe it, if we can't see it in the seismic, or the interpretation wasn't good enough, or the models weren't good enough, and so we have ways to, if it does happen, then we'll notice it. Now, will it leak back up? Not necessarily, because there, there are other sort of, like the pressure uh, response will be noticed positively first. Again, even if it does, so we say the CO2 migrates out of the storage site into the storage complex, it's still potentially lots of layers above it that are cap rocks, which is where all the first sites are going to be chosen are sites with multiple secure uh, seals. So that if whatever reason one is, doesn't work, there's still a seal above it that can trap it. But migration will stop because of CO2 uh, residual trapping. That will actually stop, even if you eject lots of CO2, that amount of CO2 you cannot get back out. It will not move to the surface of, of the seabed or whatever it is. Any other questions? Sorry? The injection facility. Yeah. Is it to be paid for or is it sponsored by a private company or by a government? Uh, so, yeah. Hmm. So, the government is sponsoring the feed design. After the feed design, I suppose it will be part government sponsored and part industry sponsored. I don't know what the final decisions are. I don't know, Niall, if you know, but. That will come down to whether Shell wants to make the, the FID, the final investment decision. And we, how much is that government willing to put forward for either Shell in the Peterhead project or the White Rose Consortium, which is basically the um, national grid and others, to say whether they want to put that money forward. So at the time, we can't say, I don't think. I don't know the, the information. Then I don't really work in the UK context. How does it happen worldwide? Yeah. Uh, well, in Norway, the example is basically the government gave them an ultimatum. It's for $15 per barrel now, $50 per tonne now. Emit it or don't. It's up to them. So Statoil said, hey, that makes sense to do this. Uh, in Quest, I think a lot of it is subsidized by the government in Canada. Uh, other projects, a lot of them are CO2 EOR projects. So it makes commercial sense to, to put the CO2 in because they get the oil back and they can sell that oil, and it's therefore commercial. So this is whole problem about commercialization of it, is it where, where are we in that field? And uh, Peterhead, probably about a year and a half, two years away before that sort of decision needs to be taken. So again, politics change rapidly. There'll be a different Scottish government in by then. Because Scot Scottish government elections are coming up. Doesn't stop, does it? Any other questions? There's a lot of research going into utilization. Yeah, that's what, is, that, is that your question? Is there a lot of, yeah, so there's, there's, there's lots of research groups around the world looking at utilization. You know, uh, bioalgae producing biofuels, et cetera, et cetera. There's, there's not too much in the way, apart from CO2 EOR, that's large scale commercial yet, that I know of. Put your hands off, you know different, but I mean, it's, it's not my specialist area, but there's lots of research, but again, it's all bench scale, it's all, oh, we think we can do this with CO2 if you, you know, we're developing that, but nothing's actually come out yet. Any other questions? We have, in the UK, so we have several storage atlases for the CO2. Uh, Norway, the UK, and other countries are sort of the leaders in doing this. We have far more storage than we produce. So we don't, we're not going to hit a limit as far as storage goes. We've got those reservoirs already sort of mapped. What's good about the, the UK scenario and several other countries is a lot of the, 
companies when they drill and explore for oil and gas, they've got to give those cores up to the states and the BGS, the British Geological Survey, keep them. So we've got all this data. It's a lot of data and it takes a long time to go through. But we've got the data and we're working through it. And this whole new website just released that goes through that. You can look around each of the storage sites in the UK that they've already properly mapped. There are many others. And already, you know, we're already over the, the storage capacity requirement for the UK. Thank you. Yeah. So can we keep you on the